Hello, this is Lisa Bowerman, and you're listening to The Sirens of Audio. We have subscribed to The Sirens of Audio YouTube channel and given the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Why have you not returned our ambassadors? G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who and the audio medium. I'm Dwayne. And I'm Philip. G'day Dwayne, g'day audiophiles. G'day Philip, how are you? I am very well, thank you. Excellent. Uh, Today's going to be a a little bit of a shorter show. First of all, I want to apologise. We were going to get this episode out last week, but I called you very, very stressed and uh, concerned about my caravan blowing away. I was out running a cyclone, so um, we, we put off last week's recording. Um, yes, yes, but, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, but, but drive we are 100, 100, driving 100 kilometres south to try and outrun a cyclone. Is that right? Uh, about 250, actually, it was. Okay, so that put a bit of hole in your planning and travel. Well, you, yeah, we, you, you've got to do these things. It's better to have a caravan and your life than be blown away. But uh, as it turned out, the cyclone fizzled out and we're back on the road again. Uh, if you can see me shaking here, um, it's... You've got dark um, too. And, and, and my wife just closed the door. Could you turn the light on for me? <laughs> God, I've gone black. Okay, that's better. I think she was getting blown away because it's very windy here. Um, right. But uh, what was I saying? Anyway. We're, we're here today, so my apologies for no podcast last week, but we are here. We've got some blaming a cyclone. Blaming a cyclone that's soft. Really, I bet you no podcast, podcast has ever had to put one off for a cyclone before. There you go. No, probably not actually. Okay, to to start off, maybe give us a little rundown. We won't do a rabbit hole today. This is all of the preamble is a rabbit hole. So just give us a rundown on the the Wendy events. We spoke briefly about the Sydney one, but now that the Melbourne one's over, what was your sense of how they all went? Unfortunately, I was unable to make it, of course, but give us your your debriefing for me. Yeah, you were very sadly missed. Um, Yeah, we talked about Sydney. So Sydney went great. There's lots of people there and just everyone appreciated Wendy. Um, Melbourne was huge. I mean, the the Melbourne crowd are so supportive and encouraging of what we do. Um, it's just, I just, yeah, I just love taking people now. You know, I'm going to take everyone to Melbourne um, just because they just are so supportive. We Good. had a, it's, we, we, it's, it's we, not as far for me to go. <laughs> no, true. So we do a dinner the night before. So it's a bit different to Sydney. We do the event all day than have a dinner for the VIPs. In Melbourne, what we've done for the last couple of events is we have a lovely hotel with a dinner, with an upstairs room. Um, the food is spectacular that we have in this is in this hotel. We get really well looked after by the staff there. And Wendy was just amazing and everyone just loved her. And you know, some people brought dolls, no can't say dolls, action figures. <laughs> people were making fun of her bringing dolls of um but yeah, there's there's um one of the, one of the fans down there makes um figures, the character option figures, and he had um Wendy Padbury's every outfit that she had for the show. And so we had this whole lineup. So if you go if you go to our page, you'll see the picture there. She yeah, they're just so talented. Um and it's just she she just spent lots of time with the VIPs and just talking and everyone just had an amazing time. And the next day she, she and she was amazing. Charlie Hayes, her daughter, um I interviewed her for about an hour. Charlie came on and made fun of her for about 45 minutes. Um, it's just it, she did a co- live commentary for episode ten of War Games, but once again, it was just her personality, her story she told. Um, we'll put some of the stuff up down the track sometime, but she was just just amazing. And yeah, I had yeah, I had a lovely time with her because I got down there because I was taking my son back to university in Melbourne. We went to the theatre together and saw a musical. What a surprise! 
Um, but also, you know, Ligon Street, and we went, we've had a lovely French restaurant on the last night. So I must have been, I was very sad to say goodbye. And um, yeah, so she, and, and then since then, she's done New Zealand and apparently been a huge hit over there as well, no surprises. And yep. she's um, currently in Asia. She's spending a few days um, in Bangkok on the way back home. So all up, she's been gone about a month. So she, she's been astounding. But the, her energy levels, her just her oh, reaction with fans. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think anyone could possibly have a bad word to, word to say about her. She was just, it, it, she, yeah, this is from, the first time from, she's done it. Hmm? From what I could see on social media, everyone had a ball who was there and yeah. they just had nothing but love for her. So that was great. Mm. So it's, a, it's the first time she's ever done an event by herself. So she was a bit worried that she'd you know, be able to, yeah, how would she manage to fill up a, a whole day? Did it with ease. And in fact, yeah, we could have had two days because once she started telling stories, it was just, you know, just wonderful. It's one of the things that makes our events quite unique, really, here in Australia, because, um, you know, most other places you'll have a, an array of guests, but here you get a really, you know, focused in on one particular uh, person for the whole day. And um, it, it, I think it makes the whole audience feel real up close and personal with them. Mm. So I did. I did tell people in Melbourne that we do have someone booked for next year already. Um, mm -hmm. Though with the plans, there's st there'll probably still be an event in October at first, anyhow. But that one's not lined up fully. So should we tell people who it is, or does not bother? I reckon we hold off for a bit, keep a, keep people in suspense. So only the people in Melbourne will know. Well, there you go. <laughs> we'll see see how much they blab. <laughs> Don't spill the beans, Melbourne people. We know where you are. All right. Uh, <laughs> On a, on a sad note, we had the news over the last week that um, the lovely Pamela Salem had passed away, and I know how much uh, you're you're a fan of hers, Philip. Yeah, I was I was really sad for a day when I heard the news because I've adored Pamela since I first saw in Robots of Death. I went on to follow her career in so many ways, so the, the professionals and um, James Bond and. And then back to Doctor Who again. And she's just always been an actress I've just admired and was so beautiful and I had a bit of a crush for. Um, and so, I, and then when we got to talk to her a couple of years ago, she was just so delightful and so charming and so friendly and so open that I just thought, you know, everything I've always wanted in terms of meeting you I've had. And, and, I, and I had dreams to contact her again. There was I was really wanting to speak to her again. And I, I, I had Molly in my head getting in contact with her the last month or two, I've been thinking about trying to get in contact with her. Um, and yep. then I heard the news, and of course, realizing, well, that's not going to happen now. So, yeah, yeah I, was, I was quite devastated by all. How are, you, how are you feeling? Yeah, very sad, a little bit sad for you, because I know how much of a fan you were too. And it was, I, I also felt, I felt privileged to be able to spend that little bit of time with her. Um, it was, it was really nice. She's a very unassuming person um, who's worked with some mega stars in her time mm. and as, i mean as far as we're concerned she is a mega star too so it was nice to be to be in her presence and um yeah so you know it was you you approached me afterwards and, and wanted to, to put a, a special uh, tribute episode together which we're working on at the moment so uh, everyone can listen out or look out for that uh, over the next few weeks uh, that'll be coming together. So that'll be nice to do. Um, one of the nice things that we got to do was um, we invited on Karen um, Gledhill, uh, who, of course, was in remembrance of the Daleks and then countermeasures, uh, to to say a few words about her. And, and we talked a lot more about Karen's life too. So we're going to, as a sort of a precursor to Pamela's uh, tribute episode, we're going to be um, sharing that interview with Karen Gledhill next time on the show. So um, so that'll be So that'll be nice. Um, and yeah, looking forward to, to putting that tribute together. We've, we've, we've done a few of them now, sadly, but that's, I guess that's what happens as time passes. Yeah. Hopefully no more for a while. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Today on the show, we are going to be doing another couple of reviews. We're getting into the reviewing side of things lately, Philip, doing lots of them and new releases from Big Finish. So I actually, why don't I ask you, which one would you like to do first? We're going to do uh, the third Doctor Revolution in Space. We're going to do the ninth Doctor Buried Threats. You choose which one you would like to talk about first. 
let's do the third doctor because I just feel like we have to go in order and he was the first he's before the ninth so we've got that's what I would have chosen and for exactly the same reason. All right. I'll read uh, a blurb for that one. The Doctor and Sarah find themselves in an asteroid on the outer reaches of Earth's solar system. It's the future, and humans have colonised this inhospitable place to mine vital materials to supply their home planet. However, links with Earth are becoming ever more strained, and forces within the colony are seeking independence. Revolution is in the air. Meanwhile, in the deepest chambers of the asteroid, a powerful force is emerging. Its influence is growing rapidly. But how will it affect Sarah Jane Smith and her place in future history? From Big Finish Productions. Doctor? Doctor, can you hear me? Sarah, are you all right? Well, I'm alive. I wouldn't go so far as to say I'm all right. What can you see? Just stars whizzing by, round and round off. Uh, I must be spinning. Can you see me? No, but I can hear you loud and clear. Doctor Who, the third Doctor Adventures, Revolution in Space. Sarah, Sarah Jane Smith, a new arrival, Mullins. That last ship was months ago. Which makes her presence all the more intriguing. If possible, I'd like to see the prison. The prison? Yes. I'm interested in your history, and it sounds fascinating. Sarah, are you sure about this? Yes. In case you'd forgotten, I'm not actually your assistant. I'm not just here to take notes and look pretty, you know. Of course not, but I... I've got a mind of my own. Well, if I deliver them victory, I'll be carried throughout Hygieia on their shoulders. Now! I'm not scared. Of course you're scared. Fear is the only rational response in my presence. I am a man of my word. May you find peace in the next life. Big finish for the love of stories. I think what we've seen so far could be just the beginning. All right, Philip. What are your thoughts on Revolution in Space? Okay, um... Loved it. It's, 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 I think I mentioned before, before we came on mic, that it's great having two third Doctor stories in the one um, month. Um, yes. The Santaran and, the Santaran and Ruton one was done by a different production team, and it's astounding the difference the two make. Um, love them both, because I think we've already talked about the Santaran and Ruton one. I think both of them are brilliant. Um, but it's just, it was amazing going back to this one and this, this, original classic production team because it just sounds so much like it's come from the 70s um i, I think yes. the first thing that strikes me is just the score i i just think um the the score that um nicholas briggs has written is just so perfect for the for this nostalgia and it is just so 70s to me it was a lot like death of the daleks there was a lot more death yeah. of the Daleks sort of feel to it than other composers this time but it is just it immediately takes you to the seventies, so that, that's the first thing. I think Jonathan Morris has just done a beautiful script. I mean, Jonathan Morris is just so reliable to hit plot points, and you know that my preference for Doctor Who story now is the one hour story. Um, so yes. this is six episodes, um, which yeah, let's be honest, it's it's being done for budget reasons. <laughs> um, you know, originally, yeah, Big Finish would always put out, you know, it's going to be, you know. Double CD, you know, the monthly range was always, you know, four episodes. Um, the box sets were, were always four stories in a box set. But for budget reasons, you know, we had the seven episode where they got rid of one episode. Now we're down to six episodes. Um, I do understand that there's a lot of constraints on being finished in terms of production. Um, but being six episodes meant they could have a much larger cast. But I think Jonathan Morris has actually really written a strong six episode story. And to be honest, it, it is the period. You know, the, back, back in the period, half the stories of every season, of, you know, John Perry's season would be six episode ones. He's, he's looking like he's doubting me. So this season, what had Time Warrior was four, Invasion was six, um, Death of the Arch was four, Monster Peladon was six, and Planet of the Spider was six. So you know, six episodes were more than all than the four episodes. So it does actually feel right to be a six parter. I do think, yeah, so. How much do you want to talk? Do you want to say something before I, I'll come back? Because I, I could keep yuck, yucking on for ages. 
Do you want to keep Yaki or do you want to say something? Well, I'll give you my initial impressions as well then. Good. Um, yes. Yes, it's it's great for the for the period. The contrast between the two episodes was stark, but still yeah. very enjoyable. As far as the music goes, I was getting a sense of I was thinking, this is kind of like this is not standard Nick Briggs, but I was kind of sensing a hybrid. And then when I listened to the extras, he explained that, yes, that's what he was doing. He was doing a hybrid of all these different musicians throughout the Third Doctor era. So then that made sense to me after, because I couldn't quite put my finger on it all the way through. Um, I was getting a sense of uh, frontier in space with the political side of things. Um, I was getting a sense of the the mutants with the colonisation type of things. And you know we had the we had the alien threat as well, so it's probably much more more like the mutants than anything else with uh, with the type of things that are in it. Um, yeah, I mean, t- t- touches a monster this is colored dead, this... on too. Yeah, uh, and as I think also, and in terms of the alien, I was thinking more Bride of Peladon, which is a big Finnish story. Um, yes. There's, well, there's, yes, touches yes. Bride, there's touches of Bride, there's touches of Bride of Peladon in there as well. So it, it really was a mix mash, really well done. So don't, it's not, that, that's not a negative. But Jonathan Morris has mishmashed so many different story elements from the John Perter era that really work well together. And he's got such an encyclopedic knowledge of his Doctor Who. He drops he drops lines in all over the place. So if you're a more casual listener or if you're a fan of the new series, just delving back into that the past, you'll still enjoy the story. But if, like us, you grew up on the third Doctor, then you're going to get all those little little lines that are in there uh, with nods to all these other different stories, which is fantastic. Yeah. So Tim Trelaw uh, was fantastic as usual. He's just he's just the doctor to me now. Like, like there's no there's no reason for me to even sort of analyze it too much. He just seems like the doctor to me. But I've got to say, Sadie Miller. Just every time I listen to her, I'm more and more yeah. impressed. As time goes by, she has just got. The character of Sarah Jane, absolutely perfect. I said it before in the Rutan story uh, from earlier in the month. Same goes for this one. Um, she's yeah. just absolutely sensational. I don't know what you think of uh, Sadie's performance. Yeah, I, I fully agree. I cannot believe how much she sounds like her mum now. So, I mean, t- Tim, I love, I do love Tim Trelaw's performance, and I can hear John Pertwee in him, but he's not John Pertwee. It, it is still obviously a different actor. There's times I, I totally lose and I'm actually really focusing on Sadie's performance, thinking she's so much like a mum. And it, it, it just she's just fully, just the inflections and the pauses, um, the scared but brave. She really is doing such an amazing job that yeah, I'm, I'm fully convinced it's Sarah Jane Smith. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, anything you want to say about the guest cast? Um, all of them are strong. Um, it was great to hear Harry Mars back. Harry Mars is, I knew from all the Benny shows, he was Adrian Wall. Oh, yes, I recognize his voice now. I hadn't put that yeah. connection together. Yeah, yep. so I, I, I picked that up as a listener because he's got this beautiful bass baritone sound. Um, quite, quite scary because he, you know, he was playing, I was gonna say, Kalori, with the accent. Kalori. Yep, so, so, you know, in Benny, he's playing a sort of wolf like creature. Um, but yeah, he's got, he's just got those that tonality. I mean, everyone was really strong. Um, I, don't, I don't think anyone was as well as a company because they they all have very different di- different roles to play, very distinct roles. It's you know it's very John Pertwee. You've got you know the officiousness of some of the prison warden. You've got yeah, it, it's it's interesting how did, did, I mean how much of Australia and Australian history and comic history did you think was in it and pick up from it. Uh, I wasn't thinking about it specifically. No. Because it's, it's a convict planet where they send the convicts to, they can't return to Earth. It, it's very much, it's it's very Australia story in lots of ways. Yeah, And the convicts true. end up staying, becoming freed, having families. Um, we, we, we haven't, for some sort of bizarre reason, sought out independence yet, which I still don't quite understand. But, um, yeah, there's, there's an awful lot of Australian colonisation in the early part. Of the, of the of the in the background to the whole formula of the planet, which I thought was interesting. Hmm. So, overall, what those, this aren't, spo- does... those aren't spoilers. That's just all background, just in terms of people. Yeah. I mean, we're not spoiling anything for you. 
overall, what this story does for me is it's it's a it's a nostalgia fest. Whereas yep. the other Third Doctor production team was more of it was it was less nostalgia, but taking those established characters and making something brand new, uh, which is always yeah. interesting as well. Um, but I, I I always tend to go for the nostalgia myself, and I love what Nick's doing here. On sound design, he's got David Rucroft again, which is someone who's worked with BBC Audio, so he's um, he's he's great. Whenever I see his name, uh, I get very excited too uh, to see his name, and. Um, yeah, just, just that sound whirring around. Definitely listen to it in your headphones because it, all the sounds, particularly the music, whirs around in your head uh, and the performances are great. It's not an overly complex story, but none of the Third Doctor stories were, really. Uh, they were just, you know, they, they had enough intrigue to keep the whole general family audience entertained throughout those episodes back in the 70s and it, they've gone back and, and recreated that to a large extent. Yeah, I, I don't think there's any era in Doctor Who that is cons as consistent as John Pertwee. I, I don't think it hits some of the highs that other shows hit. It certainly hasn't got the lows <laughs> that other other Doctors have. So, you know, every other Doctor, you can pick up, you know, classics. You can pick real stinkers. Whereas John Pertwee's there, all just this classic, classic, all just this consistent line all the way through. And, you know, and, you know if you want to pick a classic, people usually go for the Demons. And the Demons is fantastic, but it's not that much better than anything surrounding it. Everything is of a really high, consistent standard, and this actually does fit in perfectly because it, 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 it follows the mould so well. Absolutely. So you'd recommend anyone listen to this, wouldn't you, Philip? Yeah, I really, I really would, actually. Can I, can I say, this year has been so good so far, Big Finish. There's, there's so many stories that I would highly recommend. And um, this is another one that's that I would highly recommend, really worth buying, really worth listening to. Yeah, we recently spoke with Kenny Smith about our favourites from last year, and it were hard. It was hard to pick them because they were consistently good throughout. But I think this year's even stepped it up an extra notch. To be perfectly yeah, honest, I, I, I felt last year's were consistently good, but once again, you 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 were hard pushed to find the the ones that you say, "Oh, you must listen to this." And already this year, we are finding ones which I would say to people, oh, you really must do this. And you know, this is one of the, 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 the Sotaras and Rutans, definitely. I mean, they are you know, so, so good. Not the other stuff's not good, but I mean, just this uh, step. And we're going to talk about something as well, which I think everyone should buy. Absolutely. Shall we move on to the next uh, set well, of stories? That was a, wasn't a box That's a good segue. So we'll Indeed. talk about those stories, in fact, and we're going to talk about the Ninth Doctor box set, Buried Threats. And there's three stories within that set. Uh, the stories are called uh, A Theatre of Cruelty by Lisa McMullen, uh, The Running Men by Mark Wright, and Ancient History by Matt Fitton. And rather than read the blurbs, I might just go straight into the trailer for this one. Piece of history uncovered. From Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, The Ninth Doctor Adventures, Buried Threats. I want to create a theatre which will assault the senses. You sent me an invitation. A space thundering with images and crammed with sounds. Tell my story, Antonine. A theatre that disrupts and disturbs. Why write a play about a woman who killed her own father? One which taps into the space between feeling and reason. A theatre of cruelty. Is it okay if I plug myself into your brain tonight while you sleep? I'm the Doctor. This is Sergeant Ambika Desai, West Yorkshire Police. This happened before. Doctor! Intense entropic degradation. Something wonderful is happening. That's impossible. Still digging, Professor Summerfield? The Coravin burial chamber is an important academic find. For a burial chamber, it's missing a vital ingredient. There are no biological remains anywhere on the site. The Coravin. Imagine a species with the cunning of Daleks, tech skills of Cybermen, bloodlust of Volprene. The time of transcendence. This. Summon our armies home. What have you done? Something brilliant and stupid. This is our world. The 
big finish for the love of stories. Everyone run! All right, Philip, when I started listening to this, particularly the first story, I was, you know, we, we've recently characterised some of the writers and Lisa McMullen, I was listening very carefully for her style of writing. And I know she is a theatre person. She's uh, very much into theatre, but I found myself in this episode, uh, a theatre of cruelty. I found myself thinking of you, Philip, and uh, thought how much this story might connect with with you as a as a theatre person. And I didn't even realise towards the end that it was a was a historical character. I had no idea. And then I was thinking, hang on, this is a historical character. I better go and look look this guy up. So it's a uh, for, for for people who aren't so familiar with theatre history, can you tell us about the, the character in this story? Uh, yeah, well, first thing I say, Theatre of Cruelty isn't a, a form of theatre I enjoy. Um, from Theatre of Cruelty did also come interactive theatre and um, active theatre, which I do enjoy mostly if I'm in the right mood. As an audience member, sometimes I don't want to be dragged into the actual play, but sometimes it can be a fun <laughs> thing to do. Um and so, yeah, so, so even though um, um, Anton Atord um, developed a, a number of theatre techniques and he's, he's very, he's, he's like a Bertolt Brecht, um, I just think who else would, would you put him in line, line with? Um, he, he, um, so the theatre he created is interesting and it's important to study and understand because of where it drove theatre too, but I don't particularly enjoy it. A bit like Bertolt Brecht. Um, you do need to study him. It's good to see his plays, but they're painful, and you, you know you you walk out, you know, having experienced something, but it's not necessarily good. A, a bit of a, a lot of absurdist theatre can be like that too. Um, but if you're into theatre history, then he, there's the important. Um, yeah. So anyhow, I mean, he he was a French playwright and director um, who wanted to confront his audience. Uh, in originally terrifying ways. So, so the theatre of cruelty was he did lots of things on stage which were horrific or appeared horrific using special effects and stunts and, and things. And he brought his audience into the world of, of, the, of what he created. So interesting, not not a not well known by general public. And I don't think any of his works, I can't think of any of his works that are really performed anymore. But when I studied theatre, did my um, graduate diploma in expressive and performing arts, we certainly studied him for a couple of weeks because it was a part of part of the process. Um, most importantly, can I say, it's just in terms of who he's played by, um, because it was so excited to hear Alexander Vlahos back. Um, people who like the Dorian oh, Gray series, Dorian I, was, Bay, like Dorian I Gray love, fan, yeah. love, I do love Dorian Gray. And in terms of theatre of the cruelty, Dorian Gray was those stories are up there amongst theatre of the cruelty. Um, Alexander Vlahos, I think, is the most astounding actor. He is so talented. I, I'm surprised he isn't a bigger star. He deserves to be a bigger star than he is. Um, I guess he wouldn't come to big finish if he was any bigger. Um, and Dorian Gray is great. But once again, hearing his voice, hearing the richness, and just the way he's able to express truth or the truth of the character, um, he always gives a, an astounding performance. So, yeah, this is, this is an interesting work. It's historical, but it has other things thrown in. The Ninth Doctor, Christopher Eccleston, has really just perfected his role now in audio. Uh, he, he just feels so much like the Ninth Doctor. He's just so casually playing him. And it's and really, Lisa's captured every side of the, the Ninth Doctor you want to see. It's got his humour. It's got his anger. It gets his um, whimsicalness. Um, all, all the ca- strong characters that, that the Ninth Doctor was comes out beautifully in, this, in the whole box set, but this script... Um, Lisa just does a really good job. What, what do you think of the story? No, I thought uh, your your comments there on the Ninth Doctor, just so true. We were talking a minute ago about the Third Doctor and nostalgia. Well, the Ninth Doctor era on television is so long ago now that um, you know we listen to these with a with a huge sense of nostalgia. It's not new anymore. We we call his twenty years ten years twenty years isn't it the start of the new series? But yeah, yeah, is. It, yeah, it'd be almost 20 years, yeah. It's 20 years since he Good grief. 2005, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, so it's two years next year. Oh, wow, okay. And I loved that series so much. I was so disappointed when he didn't continue on. I wanted I wanted more than one series. And so that maybe that's why I was never overly happy with David Tennant for a while. But um, to get to get him back, he's just 
so perfect in the role. He's just and and the and the team is so good. Like you've got, I think Howard Carter's on music, isn't he? Howard Carter's on music. Ian Meadows is great on sound design. Helen Goldwyn's doing most of the directing uh, these days. She's done the last few box sets at, at, at the very least, and they've they've got a certain sound that is not copying the TV series, but it's close enough that anyone who loved that era is going to love this too. And it comes down, I think, you know, 50% of that. So the bulk of that is, is uh, Chris's performance. He's just yeah. sensational. Absolutely. You mentioned, you mentioned music. I mean, Howard Carter is always excellent. This work starts, the first 30 seconds is music before the story starts. And I actually yeah. had to check because I thought, I thought it must have been a music suite that had started the production. But it is the most gorgeous piece of music. Oh, not again. How am I supposed to single-handedly keep an eye on all of time and space when the multi-dimensional thingy-machine keeps sticking? I haven't touched it. Thank you. Sometimes I think you do it to wind me up. Yes, all right, very funny. I'll get that, shall I? Can't sort the dimension jumps, but you fitted yourself with a doorbell. Hang on. That's impossible. We're still in flight. Spinning through the time vortex at a million light years a nanosecond. So who the heck is at the door? It was just a beautiful entrance to the story before the story starts. So, yeah, Howard Carter. Oh, beautiful. I should say that they do name check another big Finnish author in the play, which was... Oh. How could I it, forget it, that? <laughs> it cracked it cracked me up when it happened because there is a big Finnish author. Do we know who it is or not? There's no spoilers, it or should we? No, maybe do we shouldn't. Do oh, let's, let's spoil it. It's it's Lizzie Hopley. Who? She's name checked by Lizzie the Hopley. So apparently, Lizzie Hopley has actually written on this character before and uh, done some work on him. And so Lisa name checks Lizzie Hopley um, in terms of she's listing people who've who have written works about him. One of them is in the future fictional, but Lizzie Hopley gets name checked as one of the people who's, who've studied him and came up. And it just, it, you know, it's, it's a bit of a fourth wall breaking and, and yeah, a bit naught in some ways. No, Lizzie's canonized in the in the Doctor <laughs> Who universe now. So, yeah, so Liz, Lizzie's now in the Doctor Who universe. I just thought, you yeah, that's just a charming thing that Lisa did, which just made me smile. She has it twice in the story, and both times okay. I sort of beamed because I just thought it was so funny using, yeah, a friend, um, but name checking her and putting her in. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. Second story, sorry, Dwayne. All right, uh, The Running Men by Mark Wright. So this is a, a rather personal story because he's he's talking about, uh, let me get the name of it, the um, uh, the Halifax the Halifax gibbet. So that's a that's a thing that's in Halifax where Mark lives, and um, he incorporated this into his story. So there's a lot of local history, and I really love it when writers do that because. It's the kind of thing I'm inclined to do when I write stories too, is stuff from where I'm at or my local area. Um, and, yeah, it's it's good to see Mark Wright uh, doing something. Uh, he's done lots of stuff on his own, but you often associate him with Kevin Scott as well. Uh, and, of course, he's producing the, uh, the first and second Doctors at the moment. So uh, he's got the opportunity here to write a, a, a great story. And with it, with it sort of... Be, it's kind of timey-wimey before the timey-wimey word was invented in Doctor Who chronology, eh? Uh, the way it starts out, it kind of reminded me of, of The Empty Child, The Doctor Dances, how there was that, that piece of technology that went back and the Doctor was trying to catch it, he missed it, and it created all the story. So it was basically the Doctor's fault. And here, something similar happens too. Um, so I, I like that. It makes it kind of feel like the Ninth Doctor era when those kinds of things are happening. So... Um, yeah, I really like this this story. We, there's an important guest cast that we want to talk about first, but get your uh, we'll talk about soon. But we'll get your initial impressions on the story, Philip. Yeah, one of the things I love about Doctor Who is it makes me examine and look at things I haven't learned before. And so, all through growing up, there's periods of part of my I have a love of history, which has come from Doctor Who, because something something would appear in the story, I'd go look it up, I'd research, I'd read about it. And for me, this story did the same thing in terms of the word gibbet, because I had no idea what a gibbet was. And the story sort of revolves around the Halifax gibbet. And so I had to actually go go searching to find out what a gibbet was. It's actually a place of 
execution. And in this case, it's actually a gallows type structure, which the dead were sort of hung from or, or dying for public display. And so it's, it's kind of like a T, this one is like sort of like a big T section. And they used to just hang bodies from it. So sometimes they'd hang people from it and kill them there, or often they just let them hang until they died. And yeah, so Lovely. dozens and dozens of, dozens and dozens of people were executed in this way for public display. And of course, I'd never, I'd never heard of Halifax or the Gibbet, and it made me go and research and look it up. So I, you haven't I seen love Tango Halifax? Halifax. No, I've not seen Tango Halifax. That's, You've got that's to see. um okay, because that's that's the the that Nicola one, Walker, Derek Jacobi. Yeah, okay. Is that it's Last Tango in Halifax? That was called. Last oh, Tango, Tango in Halifax. Halifax. Yeah. Last Halifax. No, I knew Last about Tango. that. I've never seen it. Okay, I'll look it up. Um, there you go. I'm have to go and watch on my list. I'm not going to get any sleep. Um, in, yeah, in terms of story, yeah, it was very enjoyable. Um, it was timey wimey. I, I liked what they did with the cast. Yeah, but yeah, it, it, most importantly for me, it just made me look up other stuff. What, what did you want to say about the cast? Uh, well, Simon Rouse was in in the cast, so of course we know him uh, as Hindle from Kinder, and I think in the extras is it Mark that was talk Mark Wright was talking about how wonderful Mark uh, Simon was in Kinder, one of the best performances ever, I think he said, in the history of Doctor Who, which truly it was. Kinder is is a great story for big names and awesome performances, and so, so for me, Simon, Simon think- Rouse is famous. Simon Rouse for me is famous for the Bill. So, I mean, he must have right. been in the bill for 10, 15 years. And, um, yep. yeah, so I, I really loved him in the bill. Yeah. So he was a standout member of the cast, uh, particularly yeah, for Mark. Was. I think uh, consider him a bit of a bit of a legend. Um, but, yeah, once again, another good. Really, the science fiction elements in it were good too. I enjoyed those. I enjoyed the way it was explained. It was done in a very ninth doctory way. So, once again, the nostalgia was great. Fantastic. Shall we talk about the third story, which is uh, was very exciting? The third story was my favourite one, but yes, let's get to the third. Yes, uh, Ancient History by Matt Fitton, uh, which incorporates the Ninth Doctor meeting Benny Summerfield, uh, which, and I wondered how they were going to do this too, because it started off with the Doctor appearing and using a pseudonym Benny not recognizing him straight away. I thought, oh, they're going to drag it on. Well, see, it starts before that because it starts really as a, as a Benny Summerfield story because the doctor mm. doesn't even appear for the first four or five minutes. It's very much mm. her story, her companions, it, it's you know, her at the dig. It's, it's very, it's very Benny. And Lisa Bowman is just magnificent. And you know, you know, I, I love my Benny, and we, we must at some point stop and do some proper stuff on Benny. Um, we, yes. we're had to, to we talked about that last stuff. year, didn't we? We did. We haven't done it yet, but yeah, we'll, we'll get to it. Um, so to me, it started off like just a traditional Benny story, and the Doctor comes in with a pseudonym, and yeah, you're not sure what's going on. We, we don't want to give spoilers away. But in, but in terms of their interplay, and, it, and, and yeah, as you say, it's not long before she does work out who he is. And it's lovely seeing Benny with another version of the Doctor, and the warmth she shows, but also she understands she she can read him, and you know because the time wars now happened, she knows something's up. And to me, it's it was that as much as it's a it's a lovely story happening all around them. To me, it was that interplay between two amazing actors, Lisa Bowman and Chris Eccleston, these two characters who have known each other for decades, um, and they interplay together. And to me, it was that that to me was just brilliant and just just worth the price of admission alone was just you know, just the, the two of them and scenes of their scenes together yeah there was some complicated storytelling in there from matt bitten uh which you've got to stop and think about which which is typical matt which is which is fine but what i loved exactly what you were saying and what i loved was the interplay between the two characters um and lisa baum is just so good she's always been so good it's just a shame that benny sort of never reached the the heights in general doctor who phantom i think she deserves um because there could be there should be a lot more benny stuff out there i mean there's a heck of a lot already but um i, I still think uh, uh, there's 
not enough focus on Benny out there because we, as much as as much as we say, River Song's not a copy of Benny. I think there is a little bit there. <laughs> Yes, I, I asked that question to someone recently, and they were saying, "Oh no, they're nothing alike to, to, to another writer." I was thinking, yeah. "Sorry, <laughs> to me, there, <laughs> there's so many similarities, and I love them both, and I think both actresses are amazing." But yeah, sorry, there's so many similarities between the two of them, and they interplay with people. And I mean, River Song's more ruthless than Benny. Benny is, yeah, Benny is sweeter, but there's a lot of other things that are just very similar. But yeah, this box set, wow! Just to me, it's probably been it's probably been my favorite Mount Doctor box set for a long time. I mean, I think it's always high standard. I was just I about to say the same. Always a high standard, but to me, this one actually pips it, and I've, I've actually found it, yeah slightly better. And I, I think Helen yes. Goldwyn really, I think because she's an actress and that's such a high quality actress herself, she really is an actor's director. Yeah. And so it's, what she's able to get out emotionally out of these actors and all the stories have high levels of emotion. Alexander Vlahos um, with the Ninth Doctor, there's really the two of them, it's, a, it's, it's not a two-hander, but the two of them have a lot of scenes together, all very powerful scenes, and they just interplay with each other. There's a lot more of an ensemble feel for the second one, but this one, once again, Chris Beckelson and Lisa Bowman, that two-hander all the way through, you're just waiting for them to be together. And at the end, it's a really emotional scene at the end and yeah. I thought that was actually really really very touching how Matt Fitz handles Matt's an amazing writer and I just love what he does yeah wonderful stuff all right on that note I think we will recommend the Ninth Doctor box set Buried Threats make sure you definitely get and have a listen to that one uh, we won't we won't do any recommendations today because the two stories were reviewed they're our recommendations get those yes absolutely yep. get those and uh I'm looking forward to next time where we can share our recent chat with Karen Gledhill with you all. Be fun. Philip, it's been lovely to be in your company once more. It's good. I was glad to know that you're safe. Shame you can't shave. But aside from that, at least you haven't been blown away. So that's the important thing. Not, not going to be shaven for quite some time, Philip, so get used to it. All right. Until next time, we'll catch you later. Bye, everyone. This has been the Sirens of Audio episode 189, reviewing Revolution in Space and Buried Threats, with your hosts Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Theme music by Joe Kramer. More about us at sirensofaudio.com. Comment below to give us your feedback or contact us via email at sirensofaudio at gmail.com or any one of our socials. Thanks for listening, audiophiles. We'll hear you next time.